Many of you know that my blessed mother received a vision when I was six months old, and the Lord told her to keep the Sabbath. We had no books, no teachers, no directions, just mother, her vision, and her Bible. A decade later, I walked into the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a bright November morning, 1940. I remember how impressed I was. Oh, the building was not impressive, but there was a spirit there, and hanging above the pulpit, the Fourth Commandment. And something seemed to say to me, this is it. In 70 years that have followed, I have not changed my mind one iota. I was 10 years old that morning. The meetings that were going on were unusual. I had belonged to the Mount Carmel Methodist Church, and we had never seen visual aids used before in meetings. Somebody here might remember the old Prager slides, glass slides, uh, glorious color. There was a little story contained in those slides called The Game of Life. And it showed mortals playing a game with the devil, taking a chance with their souls. I focused on one, trying to match wits with an arch deceiver. The devil knows all the clever moves. He will move in worldliness and move out prayer. He will move in error and move out truth. The devil will move in immorality and move out virtue. He will move in division and move out unity. He will come in with hatred and move out love, and then he will bring doubt and destroy faith. And in those slides, the trap was sprung. He had another victim in his clutches, and these depicted in powerful color, failure that comes to those who toy around with the devil himself. The Lord is patiently dealing with us, this church. Time itself is rushing toward a cataclysmic collision with eternity. The end is very near. There is this protracted delay. And it is so misunderstood by God's suffering children that many are crying out, Lord, how long? How long? There are clues all through the Word of God. One of them that I repeat in times of question, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, but not willing that any should perish. But the evidence of His soon appearing appears everywhere we look. We are in the final age. We are there. No need to make a mistake about that. It's time for us to examine ourselves personally, individually, and stay on our knees until we see our desperate need of revival and reformation, a change of heart, a change of ways, and it also includes a change in appearance. I speak freely of final things because I am utterly convicted that we are there. I notice the capricious acts of nature, earthquakes in diverse places. There were years recently, if you heard of an earthquake, you wanted to know what part of California are you talking about? Today, you got to talk about Haiti and Chile and the biggest of all in China. Storms and fires and floods 
Ellen White says, God is not seeking to destroy men in mass, but rather to wake us up. And if anybody needs to wake up, it's us. Amen. We need to wake up. Yes, the prophetic outcome is sure and certain. And God's people, by his decision, are part of this great cosmic showdown. God has worked that out. That's his program. And alas, we are not ready. The devil himself is excited. And he's excited because the Bible says he knows he has but a short time. Not only that, St. James says the devils believe. He reads the Bible and he believes. What's wrong with us? The great theme that has been chosen since Atlanta, revival and reformation, I believe to be inspired of God. I walk in here and see saints on their knees before the 8 o'clock service. If we want revival and reformation, we're already told by inspiration, these will come only in answer to prayer. Ask for rain. Ask for it. Don't just say, Lord, give it, but pray. And pray until it comes to you. Ask for rain, reformation. I read this little line and put it on my paper. It is a correction of that which is faulty, defective, inefficient, and objectionable. When we talk about reformation, that's what we're talking about. One of the most powerful moments in world history came with the reformation in Europe way back, long, long ago as the 1260 year prophecy was beginning to wind down. Finally, the Reformation turned the corner. One of the stars of the Reformation, as far as I'm concerned, was Prince Frederick, Duke of Saxony. And there were other princes in the empire who all of a sudden were believers. Charles V of Germany was breathing fire. He sent out threats and anathemas, and they were slung around like lightning bolts all across the empire. Charles was a servant of Rome and ready to do business the way Rome did it. But he first wanted to terrorize. And Duke Frederick began to spread the word amongst the princes. We should arm ourselves and meet these folk on the bloody field of battle. And when that word reached Martin Luther, he made haste to get this message back to Duke Frederick of Saxony, exhort the people to contend valiantly before the throne of God by faith and prayer. Amen. Our chief want, our chief labor is prayer. Our people are exposed to the edge of the sword, to the rage of Satan. Let them pray. From the secret place of prayer came the power that shook the world in the great reformation. And that's recorded in the great controversy. Leaders were exhorting the church then to prayer. Our leaders are doing it now. Revival and reformation and the Lord's servant says, the angels are amazed that we don't pray more. Since prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse, we don't pray more. And I'm talking about myself also. And we are told we've got to get to that if we want to see a difference. So I ask each of you to ponder, what does that mean? word mean to you. I know what prayer has been responsible for. Prayer defeated crack troops of pagans from Egypt to the promised land. The deserts were strewn with their bleaching bones. Prayer air conditioned a furnace in Babylon. Prayer took the appetite of lions in Persia. 
prayer nauseated a whale and made him vomit up a man who was prone against God's business. Luther wrote these words, inward penitence is nothing unless it produces various mortifications of the flesh. Those words were included with the 95 Theses nailed to the church door at Wittenberg. Now the spirit of prophecy says it's not enough to pray a few minutes a day, like morning and noon and evening. That's, that's a good pattern, but that's not enough. She uses a word. We got to agonize. Amen. Now I'm going to confess to you, I've been thinking about that and trying to, usually my prayer life has been thanking God for all his blessings and that's good and asking him to direct and to help and that's good asking him to save my children and that's good but he has spared me the kind of experience that called on me to agonize and yet Jesus did that the Bible says with strong cries and tears Christ prayed to his father the birds on their roosts couldn't rest. Nocturnal creatures must have heard it and wondered what's going on out here. The Lord of hosts was in prayer. That's what was going on. We face a crafty foe. And he delights when the spirit of prophecy is disparaged. The devil has emails and Facebooks and bloggers who are busied trying to discredit the spirit of prophecy, hurling their cyber maledictions at a resting prophet, a holy woman whom God chose even against her will to help his people and lead them to the establishment of this church. Humble, wonderful, God's prophetess. And there is a promise that he will use those writings to guide us through the time of trouble. He knows about it. He hates the spirit of prophecy. And if you listen to some of the people talk, you, you don't just get them objecting. They hate it. And they hate Ellen White. And they can't explain it. They just do. Well, I want to tell you this and tell myself this. If Satan succeeds in discrediting the spirit of prophecy in this church, anything goes. God will be misrepresented among his people and the world will not be impressed with us or anything else. And the devil will enjoy diminishing God's church through music through philosophical irrationalities, through silly liturgies, through standards cast to the dust, through principles that are thrown down. Everything will be diminished and corrupted and perverted in some measure if the spirit of prophecy is successfully discredited. I don't know why it is we can't stand being peculiar. No, I like to define that word. It doesn't mean that you are weird. You don't have to be weird to be peculiar. All you have to do is go home to one wife and you're peculiar. <laughs> and, and the word peculiar means distinctive and distinguishable. That's a good word. Nothing to be ashamed of. And I don't know why we seem to dread being called peculiar. No.